I am recording. All right, let, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. Mind Games 50th. Three, two, one. Untitled Beatles podcast. TJ, do you like to just mess with people's heads and like give them like a crazy mind trip? Yeah, I love messing with people's heads. I love messing with people's minds. I guess you could say, much like Foreigner, the Shandogs <laughs> into head games. Head games! <laughs> it's you and me, baby! Head games! <laughs> A lot of people have been complaining. You guys don't drop enough foreigner. <laughs> so that goes out to you. I think it's too much foreigner. Why can't they play? We're an American band. <laughs> Welcome to the Untitled Beatles podcast. I'm Tony. I'm TJ. And Tony, this is a Lennon album that yes. is at its 50th year. We've not done a John Lennon album in a few weeks. I was so excited to dive into this with you. Unfortunately, I huh. prepared the album that features Foreigner's Head Games, which I think is... <laughs> I can't name a Foreigner album. Well, make one up. It doesn't matter. Make one Make up, you, what's the you're, Foreigner you're, album? You make me improvise a Foreigner album? Yeah, this is improvised Foreigner album title. Uh, foreigner 4. Thank you. Accepted. <laughs> yes, and. Head Games was the side two opener on Foreigner's acclaimed 1979 album. Head Games. Back to Mind Games. <laughs> One of the underrated, yeah. weirdly forgotten about Lennon albums in the Lennon canon. An often overlooked and often maligned Lennon solo album, which happens to be one of my more favorite Lennon albums. So I'm I'm going to be here defending it at the Untitled Beatles podcast. Well, Tony, I'm the Dero goddess to your cot. <laughs> so get comfy on your cot. Oh, I am. Yes. That's actually comfy? a union. That's a union cot. So <laughs> you get comfy with Greg Cott. I mean, <laughs> like, not sort of personal level, but like get, get, get like a cuddler, a snug. <laughs> I have not met him. I haven't had the opportunity. Have you? I have met Greg Cott. I interviewed Greg Cott and Jim DeRogatis, the former critics, respectively, of the Tribune and Sun Times. Did I get that right? Greg Cott's Tribune. Yeah. DeRogatis the Sun Times. Times. Yeah. For many years back when city newspapers paid for rock critics. And they were kind of like, and for or still are with their wonderful podcast sound opinions, kind of the Siskel and Ebert mm -hmm. of uh, rock music in Chicago. They'd review albums and review classic albums and current albums. Matt Spiegel, uh, the great Matt Spiegel, leader of Tribute to Soros, and uh, he's on the score mm -hmm. in Chicago. He was the producer for Sound Opinions for a long time. Nice. Um, nice. So it all ties back together with, with love for the Beatles. But yes, I interviewed them for an event for Gildas Club Charity in Chicago. And all I did was on stage at Park West, bug them about why they have an anti Paul McCartney bias. And at first they thought it was funny. But after all, you could tell, like, why is this fucking guy asking us so much about like, well, no, I'm curious because I remember, uh, Greg, your review of Flaming Pie. And I remember the you brought the receipts. You just <laughs> I totally did. I'm like, at the time, the consensus was it was probably his best album since Tug of War, if not better. Why didn't you think so? Hey, it's producer Casey. I did a little bit of internet searching. I couldn't find Greg or Jim's review of Flaming Pie, but I did find this excerpt from their review of Egypt Station. And then it builds to the choruses or the bridges or whatever you want to call them of Ichiban, 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 chanted repeatedly. Um, yeah. You know, it, that is just so embarrassingly bad. Obviously, he is in that rare realm of superstardom and genius where nobody can come and say, hey, Paul, buddy, you know, that one, that's not up mm. to snuff. You know what I mean? The fact is, will you ever play this record again? Well, hey, man, uh, feel free to like and subscribe to us um, wherever you do, wherever you listen to the podcasts. Of course, we do appreciate good reviews and help support us. We're on Patreon. You can find us on UntitledBeatlesPodcast.com. We have merch. If you join the Patreon, you get access to the Discord. You can join in the discussion. It's a, it's a good group of people. Like It's going to be like-minded people that enjoy a humorous outlook on things and life, but also love this group, the Beatles. You heard of them. And Skylar, one of our Patreon members, Skylar, has been sharing various bootlegs. Uh, she just dumped a bunch of McCartney stuff, like two gigs of McCartney stuff on there. 
rare, wild, wacky stuff. Well, that, that, was, that was weird, wild stuff. It's so funny because your comedy says Leno, but your influence is cars. <laughs> <laughs> All Jay wants to do, we know two things about Jay. Yeah. He likes to tell jokes at 11.30. Tell jokes at 11.30. Yeah, and he, and he works on, he has an old truck he works on. Got an on. old truck. <laughs> He loves he loves getting in there to tinker. Uh-huh. Hey, yeah. hey, Mamus, bring me some bring me some motor oil. Eh? Mamus, bring me some motor oil. Give me bring me some Quaker steak, Mamus. Mamus, bring me. Mamus, you got any pens oil? You know, Tony, I know you love this album. I this do. has never been a favorite John album of mine, and listening to it a bunch in as I always do in different forms again, the my original Apple vinyl and the 2002 remix on CD. You know. I think this really, it's not just mid-period Lennon, it's, it's or comparatively mid-period Lennon, unfortunately. It's grade two Lennon. I don't think this is as, as poor as sometime in New York City, mm-hmm. and there are certainly some standout tracks on this record. There are, it's a John Lennon record. There's at least three classics and a handful of other good songs, but there's enough throwaways to again make me think, how much better is Mind Games than Red Rose Speedway? And for all the dogging that we give, I mean, is it better? Sure. Is it enough to keep railing Paul McCartney's solo output over the coals? Uh, can you rail over the coals, uh, or is that two metaphors in one? <laughs> That's two in one. That's the bargain you get here. It's a metaphor. It's, it's like when Columbia had two records on one compact disc. Yeah. You know, like, or the Beatlemania reissue where they shove two LPs into one jacket. Any line is in my ears. Beatlemania. It's not the Beatles, but an incredible simulation. Tony, this a little album trivia about this. This is one of only two John Lennon albums to be reissued on Capitol's budget label. Yeah. With the green um, label. It looked like the purple Capitol with the logo, but the label's green. Those were their budget line records. This and rock and roll. I mean... This album, despite having one of John's biggest all-time songs in the title track, it kind of got forgotten about. People think of this album, when you think John Lennon albums, just spur of, uh, just top of mind here, I didn't want to jot this down, you think Imagine, Plastic Ono Band, you think mm-hmm. you think Double Fantasy. Yeah, um, you do, yeah. Walls and Bridges probably next, but like, and I'm not even talking quality as much as the albums that come to mind when you think about solo John records. And listening to this again, like I said, there are some classics, there's some great songs, but there's probably more duds than any other John Lennon solo record. I mean, that's an opinion. That's yours, right? Yeah. See, I think Walls and Bridges has more duds. And I know people for some reason. Yeah, I've like it seems to be I know I'm in the minority on this. The consensus is that Walls and Bridges is a better record. I disagree. I just like the songs on Mind Games better. I I agree with you that it's not a level one. It is. It's a level two. Yeah. But like you said, three classics and a bunch of good songs, <laughs> it sounds like a good record to me. I just, I'm more like, well, why is it being dogged so much? Uh, there's two on there that I think are clunkers, but the rest I, I quite like. Well, we'll get into this and more next week on the Untitled <laughs> Beatles podcast. Untitled Beatles podcast. Now, man, I do have one of those Capital Green Label reissues. That's that's the, uh, the only copy of this record I actually have is the... Uh, from 1980, the Jacksonville pressing and the previous owner scratched out half of the song titles on the, he scratched, he or she, they scratched out uh tight as I Sumasin, I'm sorry. That one bring on the Lucy Newtopian international anthem. Only people in meat city. Maybe we don't need all that. <laughs> Tony, what else did the original owner do? Does it smell like fucking <laughs> Is there, are there remnants of bad weed? Only on only people for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> all the only people. <laughs> Do they all come? <laughs> yeah. But yeah, man, there's no ultimate mix reissue of this album yet. It's coming out next summer, turns out. So I'm looking forward to that. In a massive set. What did you say? Five LPs or something insane? It says six discs is what I read. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So I think it'll probably be like the 10 inch, you know, like that kind of packaging, right? For the plastic Ono and all that with the CDs. Okay. Yeah, possibly. I'm thinking it'll have that kind of 10 inch vibe to it. (laughs) But yeah, there's no stripped down version of this album. Maybe we'll get that in that reissue because yeah, there's a lot of rough mixes that are floating around that sound really great because Lennon 
produced this. And, you know, I think he learned a lot of stuff from Phil Spector. No doubt. Right? Yeah. So the production on it's a little interesting, to say the least. There's a great bootleg called Absolute Elsewhere that has a lot of the rough mixes where there's not as many overdubs. It would be your, you know, stripped down version of this album. Uh, you know, I've heard a few of those from Lost Lennon tapes and random bootlegs. There's, what, three or four on the Lennon anthology. Not uh, Some are demos, mm -hmm. some are rough like tapes. More demos, yeah. Yeah, like the working versions of Mind Games from 69 and 70 before they were called my, Mind Games. Yeah, so there is stuff out there. And the 2002 remix, which we'll talk about as we go, that was only available on CD, that was the only format it was reissued, a very American-centric reissue, the Jewel Case, has the American Apple pressings on the inside and, okay. and not the standard <laughs> British ones. And in the booklet, they show like the ads for the U.S. single. It's just interesting that it's interesting. one of the more U.S. centric, especially in the, in the era of all the Beatles reissues, except Magical Mystery Tour, Huning so close to the British stuff. But yeah, the 2002 remix that since disappeared out of print has three demos on it as well. So it'll be interesting to see what's included when they do that box set of my games. Tony, it's still a John Lennon album. I still love it. I, yeah. th I think my opinion is rooted in defense of Paul McCartney. Again, where it's like, wait a minute. <laughs> if, 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 if we're going to slag off on Red Rose Speedway a bunch, like... How much better is Mind Games than Red Rose Speedway? And I'm, I've got some comparisons coming up. <laughs> it's so funny. I guess, yeah, I just, I don't think that way. So I'm never like, oh, this is fucking better than that, you know? <laughs> so I don't know. <laughs> to me, it's just like, let me listen to this record and enjoy it. Like, why does everyone have to tear at it? That's how you feel about Paul. Because you know? it's it's just it's just defense of Paul McCartney. And life is a midday ESPN <laughs> show. And I'm yeah, Stephen I A. Smith and you're Skip Bayless. And let's fight. <laughs> so this is a time. This is a place. You want to run your mouth. We can be two consenting adults. We can finish it here. OK, that's fine. Perfect. You want to do it now? I'd love to do it right now. Well, stand your butt up then. You stand your butt up. Oh, hold on. Oh, hold, stop it. Well, okay, man. So 1973 was a real bummer for Lennon because Nixon's in the White House. They're starting to, you know, tap his phones and all this shit. He's sort of distancing himself from Jerry Rubin, Elephant's Memory, all that. I feel like, uh, that was, that didn't work, you know, and literally, um, yeah, sa sales wise, well, it didn't help him sales wise and it didn't help his desire to stay in America. Yeah. Yeah. But they're determined to stick it out. They move into the Dakota on the Upper West Side. Uh, spring of 1973. There's records it was April. There's records that it was May. Anyway, somewhere around there. There's other records that it was May Pang. Uh-oh. <laughs> um, <laughs> they say April showers bring May Pang. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, Yoko is recording Feeling the Space, which is also celebrating its 50th anniversary this year. Maybe we'll get a chance to deep dish on that one. On your solo episode. <laughs> <laughs> well, we just did the Ringo EP. We have to do the Yoko <laughs> Feeling the Space record because it's the same players, man. John liked the feel on that record. So he got the same players to play on his record. They recorded it at the record plant in New York City. Uh, it's the Plastic UFO No Band. So you got David Spinoza on guitar who played with McCartney on Ram. On Ram. Unbeknownst to John. Yeah, I, I read that Spinoza, hey, Spinoza, where's my fucking pizza, guy? <laughs> yeah, yeah, hey, get a cannoli, hey, Spinoza, give me my cannoli. But coming in for 20 fucking years, you, you ain't got my order right. <laughs> yeah, I, I read that Dave Spinoza uh, was afraid that if John found out that he played with Paul, that he'd be <laughs> right. fired from the gig. <laughs> right, right. And then he ended up saying like, yeah, well, Paul's got good taste in players or something to that effect. Yeah. Gordon Edwards on bass from the jazz funk band Stuff. Kenny Archer on keys. He also worked on the, with Paul Williams on the Muppet movie. He uh, Rainbow Connection, he co-wrote with him. Jim Keltner on drums. Michael Brecker on sax. Arthur Jenkins on percussion. And Sneaky Pete Kleino from the Flying Burrito Brothers on the pedal steel. So I love that sound. I mean, this was, it was a great band. It's great band. And on a couple of the tracks, the rockers, uh, Rick Murata played. He, uh, yes, yes. he played with Steely Dan, great session drummer. Yep, he's on there too. So it's actually right during this time when they're doing mind games and recording, that's actually when the Lost Weekend begins. John and Yoko separate. John gets a three-story penthouse at 434 East 52nd Street. And he lives there with May Pang, as per Yoko. <laughs> you know, Tony, before we get to that, I had three stories that were published in Penthouse in the... <laughs> 
early oh, 1990s. Are you a forum writer? You know, I'm a forum writer too. too. What was yours about? My, uh, well, I bought a I bought a water couch, a big white water couch in the early 80s. <laughs> a water couch. So it's like a water bed, but it's a water couch. I know yes, what you're it's, it, yeah. it, no, it, I have better... potpourri. I know what you mean. Well, you know what I do like about this record is that it does take a more personal turn. We're we're, out, we're definitely out of the political stuff for the most part. You know, you got one political song in there, but it's one of his best, I think. Maybe two. We'll get to that. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Oh yeah. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> sure. But yeah, the album kind of came and went without much fanfare. Rock critics were pretty unkind to it and still don't regard it very highly. Even John, looking back, he said the Mind Game single is fine, but there's just no energy to sustain through the album and there's no clarity of vision. That cover says more than the record to me. I'll give him that. I'll give him that. Again, I'm not saying this is his best work. I'm just saying, you know what, I, I think I rank it probably in third place for Lennon records that came out in his lifetime. Okay. I take it over Double Fantasy. Oh, yeah. And Walls and Bridges. Okay, that's fair. Yeah. So what do you put above it then? You've got Milk and Imagine Honey. Imagine and Plastic Honey. Plastic. <laughs> oh, no. Pla- plastic <laughs> that's honey. the mind game. You threw a mind game at me. <laughs> no is the answer. And you know that for sure. Yeah, no, I know. I, 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 lo- I love Plastic Honey. The mashup of Mother and Osanity is so good. <laughs> Cut it out. (laughs) Oh, speaking of cut it out, TJ, John Lennon created the album design himself. He cut the photos out himself and made this collage. I also like the album cover. I think it looks fucking cool. It's a great album cover. And it's cool. The 2002 CD has a lot more Lennon drawings and information about how it charted. Ooh. It's really a shame that the that the Lennon and get it's, that. it's wonderful and it's it's remixed as well and it sounds really great. Peter Cobham remixed it. Yeah, yeah. The 2002 mixes is the way to hear this record, in my opinion. No question. It's just it it's not muddy. And Yoko authorized these remixes of the entire Lennon catalog of the time. Some were just remastered, not all were remixed, and then they disappeared, and now they're doing them again for the ultimate mixes. So seek it out. What I want to say quickly, Tony, and we talked about the string Red Rose Speedway, but just to reiterate, I, again, I love this album too. I think there's classic songs on here, but I want to mention 1973, the albums that year brought us included Houses of the Holy, Inner Visions, mm-hmm. Dark Side of the Moon, Quadrophenia, you right, know, yeah. Red Rose Speedway and Mind Games, we love, but as rock albums, neither are in the league of, and I know Dark Side of the Moon is not a quote unquote, it's not an all out rock album, but it, but it, it is a rock album. Yeah, it's you a rock I mean? album. It's, it's an art rock album, but you know, it's definitely a rock. Yeah, yeah, it's not a pop album. No, it's not. And and <laughs> Intervisions is R and B, but in terms of creative genius, that counts as well. So it's just interesting that as many trails as the Beatles blazed by seventy three as solo artists, while they were churning out great memorable work that's worth listening to to this very day it's not in the same league as some of the albums i just mentioned they're no longer leading the pack they're making great contributions but you can't compare mind games with inner visions i agree yeah again in the canon of lennon stuff i still think it's great yeah yeah um yeah i I like this cover john carrying a bag what do you think's in that bag cookies <laughs> uh, yeah, John, on the front cover, John's walking away from the uh, Ono Mountain Range out there in the Nebraskan Panhandle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's Yoko's face as kind of a mountain range. There's two sons uh, in the background representing, I suppose, both their spirits, uh-huh. or so I've read. <laughs> <laughs> or so you just suppose. <laughs> and then in the lower right corner, there's that red kind of stamp. That is John Lennon's chop, which is like a Japanese stamp. It translates to like a cloud, beautiful sound. 
My God, I thought that was the original QR code. I've been scanning it ever since I got, <laughs> got a camera phone. Trying to get a discount on those John Lennon's <laughs> fish huts, fish sticks. <laughs> Only available at Kenny Rogers Roasters for Lent. <laughs> oh, TJ, should we go to Font Lover's Corner? We have to. We literally have to. <laughs> okay. Welcome to Font Lover's Corner. Oh, today's font in question. Futura, designed by Paul Renner in 1927. It has an appearance of efficiency and forwardness. It has been used by Volkswagen, Sesame Street, and the Pittsburgh Steelers, most notably by offensive lineman Tunch Ilkin. Thank you for visiting <laughs> yeah. Font Lover's Corner. Fonts, <laughs> Love those hunts. Uh, so, okay, that's, that's good to know. Good to know. Yeah, thanks. Good, good info. <laughs> we don't know that guy's name, but thank you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for letting us know. And then you flip the cover, and the moons are replaced by these rainbow cutouts, song titles, and then John is closer to us on the back cover. He's walking away from Yoko, symbolically. And, of course, it came with an inner sleeve with the, with the lyrics and the album credits with some of John Lennon's drawings and a crisp white inner sleeve that I didn't have until I bought the 2015 um, vinyl reissue. Nice. I mean, I, I had the CD booklet, but the only pressing I've ever had of this was a copy I got on Apple, uh, God, in the, in the late 80s. Right. That I just got because it was like $2 at a record store. I'm like, oh, I don't have this. Exactly. That's how I bought yeah. it. Yeah. I was I was snapping up John Lennon records sometime in the 90s because they were going for like three bucks. And obviously, yeah, I have this like cheap pressing the budget reissue. But but that's cool. I wish I had that. Yeah. I must collect <laughs> all the you. records. <laughs> I'm sure you. <laughs> I ain't giving up my Apple, son. <laughs> oh, okay. That's fair. <laughs> well, yeah, because I, I put my mind games in the spokes of my bicycle anyway. So. <laughs> Get that cool sound. I'll trade you one mind games for one Griffey Jr. rookie card. <laughs> yeah, the inner sleeve's kind of cool, too, because there's the Declaration of Newtopia on it. Citizenship of the country can be obtained by declaration of your awareness of Newtopia. Newtopia has no land, no boundaries, no passports, only people. Mm-hmm. Newtopia has no laws other than cosmic. And then there's some wacky credits. Extra sensory percussion by Dr. Winston O'Boogie and Los Paranoias. Yeah, it's interesting that he says Los Paranoias right? when that's the tune Paul was improvising during the recording of White Album. Yeah, I think that's like that was one of their old goofs from back in the old days. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's why they're giggling throughout it. Yeah. Los Paranoias. <laughs> Disease by Dennis. These are more wacky credits. And Space by Yoko. Very telling. Space. Yeah. Feeling the space. Come on, come on. Feeling it, feeling it. (laughs) A couple quotes. Madness is the first sign of dandruff. That's a quote by Dr. Winston O'Boogie. Yeah, and of course, he was singing about uh, the band that gave us the song Our House. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. He discovered uh, madness. (laughs) And the circle. He named the circle and he discovered madness. That's the thing about Dr. Winston O'Boogie. Uh, Of course, that's John Lennon. Uh, And then only people can change the world. Lowercase y dot lowercase o dot. That's Yoko Ono. Yeah. So that's kind of her. Yeah, that's kind of her thing. The Declaration of Independence with Newtopia was equal parts sarcastic and I think also quite literal given the immigration issues. Yeah, that was them using comedy to, yeah, deal with their very stressful immigration problems. Yeah. Yeah. Shall we go track by track, TJ? Let's deep dish this album. I love it, man. Well, it starts off with the title cut. This is one of my favorite John Lennon songs, period. So it starts with that. I'm just saying that. I love this song. I'll never stop loving this song. It is one of his greatest songs. He manages to evoke some of the same spirit of Imagine. And this album, by the way, 
kind of serves a bit like an at least the first couple tracks a bit like an effort to be a carbon copy of imagine after mm-hmm. the yeah. very disappointing artistically and commercially sometime in new york city which of course we talked about a month or two ago but yeah this is this song is put on every hits compilation he's ever released it is mm-hmm. one of his best songs i love that it shifts from dreamy into a reggae groove without ever feeling forced yeah The stylistic shifts in this feel so organic, like the best Beatles work. I'm not saying the song is Strawberry Fields or I'm the Walrus, but it feels born out of those dreamlike compositions. Number yeah. nine, Dream, on the next album would I have agree. the same feel to me. I totally. actually prefer these two songs. I get Imagine's importance, and I, God bless Imagine, but yeah, man, this and number nine, Dream from Walls and Bridges I are higher on my John list. I agree. I'm with you. We share that, man, for sure. Yeah. I've always loved this song. I love that there's a Mellotron on this. That's one of my favorite elements. This is 73. People have moved on to the ARPs since and Moogs, Moogs, all that stuff. But John, yeah, still had a Mellotron on this record. I love it. I love it's that reedy sound that sounds like cellos or whatever. It's, yeah. I love it. It works. Yeah. That ascending three note guitar pattern that goes on throughout. You know, it's in C. It's got a kind of a downward progression, but then you've got the guitar going up. It's dreamy. This song makes me feel something. I love this song. This song also gets me a little emotional, especially if you watch the goddamn video, you know, yeah. Oh, yeah. of him, you know, walking around New York City and stuff, yeah. it's accessible and all that. Um, yeah, it gets me. That's all he ever wanted. That's all John ever wanted. Yeah, it gets me, man. It gets me. So I love this song. I'll, I'll always love it. It's, it's, it's also a simple. It's just a simple song. It's one of those things that Lennon was so good at was just like taking these chords that you know, there's no like crazy John Lennon chords in this. This is a simple song. I love it. And his voice, the falsetto, and there's more falsetto yeah. on this album to come. Yeah. But the, yeah. the for better or for worse, <laughs> for better or for worse. But <laughs> the falsetto that takes it to the very end before he's so smart to save, make love, not war for the end at the fade mm-hmm. out. He even remarked by 73, it had become a little bit cliche. Yeah, and and he knew that. He knew it. And the world had moved on from the idealism of the 60s. A bit more cynicism had crept in. Funny Mm -hmm. how that's concurrent with Nixon, that the cynicism creeps in. And then, of course, was paid off uh, during Watergate when everyone had a good reason to be cynical for all those Nixon years. in Vietnam, which he's going to get to in this record again as well. But, Tony, this song, I love it. It is a John classic there, if you listen to the different versions of this, I think the 2002 remix is my favorite. The ultimate yeah. mix from 2020 is way more bass heavy. There's more organ prominent and it's great. But for me, the 2002 mix of this is where it's at. I completely agree with you. Yeah, I heard like a Hammond organ part I'd never heard before on that 2002 mix, man. Yeah, yeah, it comes around the, the drum roll around Keltner's drum roll. Keltner's great in this too because it's not super slick. It feels yeah, it's it plotting. feels a little rough and plotting, <laughs> which is great. Almost like Ringo's behind there. I like it, man. I like it. Yeah, song dates back to '69. You can hear uh, the demos of it, "Make Love Not War," and "I Promise," and then uh, became "Mind Games" after he read a book in '72 called "Mind Games" by Robert Masters and Gene Houston. Yeah, on the John Lennon website, you can see he, there's this drawing of a cat and he scrawled, I have read three important and revolutionary books in the last two years. Yoko Ono's Grapefruit, thank you. Arthur Janice's Primal Scream and now Mind Games. Now, just imagine if he'd read Tales of a Fourth Grade Nothing instead, TJ. Fudge! <laughs> Fudge is not, I'm not in the right key. Never mind. <laughs> How do you, I was about to make a super fudge reference. How do you know the song? Was there a song from Tales of Fourth Grade Nothing? No, it's a book that also came out in 72 or 3 or whatever. <laughs> I'm just saying. I know, but what he, do he you up on oh. Mind Games. What if he had read a different you, book? <laughs> you're singing fudge to the Mind Games melody. <laughs> fudge is not the answer. <laughs> Smear and mashed potatoes. 
on the wall. <laughs> That's right. All right. Anyway, thank yeah, you. man. There you Use go. Use it or don't. <laughs> Hey, man, you just Judy Bloomed it. I'm not going to ruin it. It was great. That same drawing is in the booklet of the 2002 release. I love that. Yeah, yeah. that cat drawing. Which is awesome. Yeah, and it was a single. It charted, man, got up to number 18 in the U.S., number 26 in the U.K., and number six in Chicago. This song did very well in Chicago. That's amazing. Yeah, number six, just behind Jardinaire, Celery Salt, Malort, and Moo and Oink. <laughs> Moo and Oink! We got baby, 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 bear ribs, roast beef, hot links, and more to give. Tommy likes ribs and chicken wings. If you like you, let me hear you scream. Wave a catfish. Scream for real. <laughs> you the original guy, much like Dean Richards is the original, that car could be worth money. That old car might be worth money. Call Victory Auto Records at 860-2000 for a quote. You're the original Moo and Oink VO guy, which <laughs> did not age well. <laughs> <laughs> no, that one didn't age well. But wait, you, it looks like you've got the single right there behind you. Do you got the, the 45? Yes, I've, I've got the 45. This is what's interesting. It's starting to fall off. I got this at the Sam Goody in Midtown Manhattan in 1980. Four for a dollar wow. ninety nine, and it's the Rainbow Capital Press, and we did it on a trip to New York. That's awesome, man. yeah. And we got the Rainbow Capital Pressing, which I think I I sent you because the B side of this, which is Meat City, yeah, the B side is different than the album version, right? Yes, yeah, that's cool, man. Which we shall get to. We'll get to that. I was gonna say, let's take a look at that uh, cover. That's John Lennon, and then it like he has a toupee on that's Yoko's face. <laughs> Like as a as hair, it's basically it's Yoko, it's, it's Yoko Mountain on his head. <laughs> yeah, it's just it's just a strange cover to me. Well, and this is what's interesting, Tony. So when I bought this, this is the Rainbow Capital pressing, which was made in '83. The last time this was ever pressed as a 45 in America. That's cool. So what's interesting to me about this is it still had the picture sleeve in record stores on the Rainbow Capital issue which means they must with the apple logo no longer an apple they must have still had extra pressings of this in stock much like you could find the ubla di ubla da 45 right. um with the with the white album fake sleeve on the rainbow capital and i think the later purple capital as well so mm. to find one of these with a picture sleeve in a record store in 1984 i felt very lucky and it's just really fun to have. It's a John song. I've actually played. It's in good shape, but it's clearly been played a lot. Because sure. even as a kid, I just love this tune. It's a good song, man. And by the way, we are selling Yoko facial toupees for only $19.99. Untitledbeatlespodcast.com. I'm TJ Shanoff, and I'll give you a Yoko facial. <laughs> so, yeah, like you said, man, this album is almost like a carbon copy of imagine the album because the second track is kind of a country sounding one four five thing a retread of crippled inside called tight as a dollar sign yeah this uh john's the original emoji king (laughs) (laughs) he really is and there you go the beatles invented emojis there you go Uh, the, the original draft, this was not a dollar sign. It, it was, a, it was a, a pound sign. And John kind of made the first hashtag. Jim Morrison didn't. More people compare. You know, uh, Oliver Stone didn't make a movie about John Lennon. I'm just saying. I'm just saying that. Okay. I heard. Okay. <laughs> that movie drove me nuts. The Doors movie? The Doors kind of drive me nuts, too. I've been doing the same joke since 1988. A keyboard guy that can't stand the Doors. That's funny. That's not the kind of keyboard I like. Rayman's Eric's too talented for me. I like pounding. <laughs> <laughs> Chicago's own Ray Manzer. <laughs> That's right. Speaking of pounding, back to tight as this sounds like he's trying to do That's All Right, Mama. The, oh, the yeah, Elvis version sure. of it. It's got that kind of groove to it. Well, that's all right, Mama. That's all right for you. That's all right, Mama. Just any way you do it. That's all right. That's all right. That's all right. It's like 50s kind of rockabilly country rock. Um, but yeah, you're right. It, it it feels a little bit like Crippled Inside. It rocks a little bit harder. As opposed to some of the other rock tracks on this record, this one does feel a bit like a forced throwaway. It's fun, yeah. but nothing's going on here. And I think the guitar solo is a little stupid. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
Well, sometimes rock is supposed to be stupid, but yeah, I, 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 I'm not going to like, uh, yeah, this one, I climb off my mountain a little bit for, uh, this one. John called it Tex-Mex, which is funny. John loved fajitas. <laughs> you know, in <laughs> fact, after he was with May Pang and Yoko went away, John wanted his baby back. Baby back. Baby back. Baby back. Baby back. He pitched this song to Waylon Jennings, who did not do it. Now, TJ, I was going to ask you, do you pronounce this song tight a dollar sign? Uh, I call it the dollar sign reminds me enough of an IV because IVs cost money. So I call it tight AIV, which is America's. I call it tight AFV, America's funniest home videos. It was so me. Uh, the guys in Eight Arms to Hold You said that it's the first solo Lennon song to not be about something. The George song. <laughs> <laughs> every, uh-huh. every other song. <laughs> the James Taylor song. Um, yeah, uh, you know, I don't, uh, I prefer Crippled Inside to this. I like what it's, Crippled Inside too. actually says something. Yeah, I prefer Crippled Inside too. And Indian Rope Trick? Uh-uh. You canceled, Lennon. Oh, is that one of the lyrics? <laughs> tight as an Indian Rope Trick. Oh, I missed that. I missed that. It should be tight as a Guardian's Rope Trick. <laughs> Yes, it should be. Or a commander's. <laughs> um, I mean, it goes without saying it's a it's a play on words. Tight as tight ass. We do know that. Uh, but yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Fun, fun, fun. Let's move on. Wait, first, before we do, was Yoko a butt person? <laughs> I, I don't know, TJ. I don't know. I'm not a butt man. I, we've, we've established that you are a butt man. <laughs> In previous episodes. I'm a so. butt man and a cub fan. Oh, I know. I just had to do that drop. It doesn't work. I just, I need to figure it out. The T's don't. You can't throw a T in and it works. I got to figure it out. Hey, I'm a cub fan. He's a cub fan. And I'm a butt man. He's a butt man. Ooh, Holy cow. Holy cow. I don't know, Tony. I think that worked pretty damn well. Hi there. It's Casey again. Our Mind Games deep dish ran a little bit too long for what we could squeeze into a single episode this week. So we will be back again next weekend, Thanksgiving weekend, to cap off the record. And speaking of Thanksgiving, we would be remiss to go into the holiday without thanking you all for listening and for supporting the show. This year, we launched our Patreon program to help keep the lights on. And I think I can speak for TJ and Tony when I say... We are so grateful your contributions have not only helped us put out 44 fresh new episodes and counting, but it also helped us get the gear we needed to record our first live episode from Beetlefest in August. Your support, financial and otherwise, means so much to our small fledgling enterprise. You can find merch, Patreon info, and so much more at our website, untitledbeatlespodcast.com. And of course, we'd like to specifically thank our Patreon Star Club members. Long live George Harrison, Glenn K from Iowa, Matt Kaharski, Beetle Dave, Susan from Baltimore, Bert Chide, Joanne S, David S from Chicago. Uh, Darling, (laughs) I'd love to thank Thank you. you. Max Como in Montreal, Matt Meyer from Spring Hill, Tennessee, Mick B from Minnesota, Nowhere Doug Tabor, Stephen A, Mary Kate, Skyler, Mr. D Sticker, Michael S, Cat V from Minneapolis, Anthony P in Portland, Terrence D, Dave B, Steve T, Mark Guarino in Chicago, and of course, Steve L from the fine, fine state of Indiana. Darling, you know what I want to say to you? I'd like to thank you. And that's it for this week. We'll be back again next weekend with the rest of our deep dish into mind games. And that's all I got. I got uh, no quip, no clever needle drop to close the show on. Just happy Thanksgiving. Well, thank you, darling. Untitled Beatles podcast. Like and subscribe. 